uh, and I'm Alex Lee. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the coordinator for the Lauren and Halem Watershed Council. So the Lauren and Halem Watershed Council is dedicated to the protection, preservation, and enhancement of the Halem Watershed through leadership, cooperation, and education. And the way that we do that is by working with landowners, private companies, local, state, and federal agencies, and lo our local community to restore and enhance habitat for fish and wildlife. We do this through restoration and enhancement projects, such as fish passage barrier removals, riparian plantings, in-stream enhancement, uh, like large woody debris placements, wetland restorations, and, and we also do outreach and education. We table at farmer market, farm, <coughs> we table at farmers markets. We have an annual barbecue that the public is welcome to join us at and celebrate. Um, we co-host the Halen Bay Estuary cleanup every two years with the. Uh, Lauren Halem Community Trust and save the date because that is upcoming on March Saturday, March 11th um, And we host a speaker series in the winter time um, To bring in folks from the natural resources world to give uh, educational presentations once a month So in 2016 what did the watershed council get done as far as restoration and enhancement goes we actively worked on seven sites across the watershed to improve habitat for fish and wildlife, water quality, and watershed function. We replaced one tide gate to restore connection to one and a half miles of <clears throat> and 16 acres of slough habitat important for rearing juvenile salmon. And we constructed 21 complex, complex large woody debris structures throughout two and a half mile, almost two and a half miles of stream, enhancing complexity, <coughs> spawning habitat, and rearing habitat for salmon. This is a map of the projects that we actively worked on this year, um, including our on-the-ground projects um, and our monitoring and maintenance projects, and then one that is uh, was in the development phase this year and will go to construction next summer. So that's just to kind of give you an idea of where things are located throughout the watershed. Uh, I'm going to get into some project specifics for the next few minutes. So the first one is our McDonald Slough Reconnection, pro Reconnection Project, um, which is just upstream on the Nehalem from here, uh, where the North Fork Nehalem and Main Stem Nehalem come together. It's just upstream from that intersection. And the goals of the projects were to, project was to restore fish passage to the slough um, by installing a fish-friendly tide gate assembly, removing old tide gates seen here, and restoring the natural hydrology of the slough. So here's an aerial view of where the old tide gates were located. Um, <clears throat> you can kind of see a little bit of them. And then the new tide gates are actually were installed right in this area. And so it kind of, um, the historic mouth is probably over here. And so we've installed the new structure there. Uh, McDonald Slough is one of the largest sloughs in the Nehalem Estuary, draining approximately 0.8 square miles um, and three tributaries. It's key to draining the North Fork and Main Stem Nehalem areas during floods. Um, and the land surrounding it is an active dairy farm owned by the Neary family. <clears throat> and there is a very healthy riparian area along the slough, especially as you get further back, it goes into a spruce, uh, historic spruce swamp. So here's the other side, the slough side of the old tide gates. It was two <coughs> five foot long um, top hinged gates, one wood and one aluminum that had both recently experienced uh, significant fa failures and they were default closed. So unless there was a really high flow coming from the slough side of fresh water, the gates were basically closed and uh, blocked fish, fish passage. When they were open, um, <clears throat> During those significant flows, they were probably still a barrier because of the velocities that would have been in those gates. Um, so this is a photo of the beginning of construction and the things that you find buried. Um, that looks like an old log uh, buried in the berm there. So the <clears throat> disconnection of the slough from the... I'm getting ahead of myself. The fact that fish could potentially get into the slough at certain times during those high velocity areas likely increased predation when they got stuck on the slough side 
Uh, fish would have also gathered at the outside of the gates, um, being able to sense the fresh water, and that would have increased predation on them as well. <clears throat> the blockage of the tide gates would have caused poor water quality conditions due to the limited exchange between the freshwater and the saltwater systems. Um, there were high summer temperatures within the slough because there wasn't a lot of freshwater uh, input during that time. <clears throat> there would have been low dissolved oxygen and low, low, complex, low complexity and poor tidal exchange uh, before this project was completed. So these are just some pictures of uh, the process that went through um, as they were building the tide gate itself. The project improved uh, salmonid access to over one and a half miles of rearing and spawning habitat and over 16 acres of slough habitat. At the end of that is a forested freshwater um, wetland with freshwater emergent plants. The new structures will improve the nutrient exchange as well as summer temperatures in the slough um, through that exchange of fresh water with salt water. It'll also decrease the amount of sedimentation and fill within the slough, which can be a problem, um, can cause habitat loss. As the water's coming down from the tributary streams, they bring in a lot of salt uh, of sediment, and it would drop out when it hit the gates and slowed down. So this project improved in-stream habitat complexity. As well, we um, placed large wood within the slough and on the riverside um, to create more habitat for fish to hide in and to create a more complex area. So the new structure is two side-by-side -side concrete block <coughs> buildings, um, and they look huge in this. The other side, let me go back. So these are the doors on the outside, um, and these are six-by-six-foot side-hinged doors and those allow for a more even opening um, during the exchange. And they're all connected to what's called a muted tide regulator. And so <clears throat> this device is currently set at about <coughs> between four and five feet. So when the tide comes in, so on a low tide, the, the tide gates are open. Um, and there's connection throughout them. As the tide comes in, when it reaches about a four foot tide, the gate, the muted tide regulator basically bobs up and shuts the gates. And then it doesn't open again until there's a pressure differential from the inside of the slough here. Um, so basically there's more water in the slough than outside the slough, and then they will open back up again. So this structure, the, the concrete box culvert, is um, designed for better fish passage. Um, it has a much longer life especially within a saltwater environment than a metal corrugated um, pipe would. And this the way the structure is built puts a lot less stress um, on the structure with the tidal exchange and the opening and closing of the gates, which can, with a standard tide gate, can cause um, a malfunction or a, a failure. So this design greatly extends the time that the gates are open. Um, and allows for fish passage. So this is the first um, tide cycle to enter McDonald's Slough in over 50 years. So it provides a muted tidal exchange, as you can really see in this recent photo from one of the King Tide events that we had. This is the riverside, and it's pretty close to going over the bank. Um, and within the slough, there's a, quite a big difference in how much water is outside. So this allows for there to be tidal exchange and for fish to access this important habitat, but also preserves the farmland um, on the other side from saltwater intrusion, which would kill the grass for um, if it were to have a tide. And our next project that we completed this year um, is the Little Grand Rapids Large Wood Enhancement Project, and this is in the upper portion of the watershed uh, towards the headwaters of the 
upper north fork, the little north fork. Um, and so the goal of this project was to add large woody debris um, to increase stream complexity and gravel recruitment. Uh, this is a photo of the stream before the project was implemented. Uh, you can see that it's, it's got a lot of coarse wood on the sides, um, but there isn't any large wood within the stream. And here's another example. Um, the stream itself has several high, high poten potential high quality spawning areas for coho salmon. Um, with a broad, low gradient habitat. Um, so in high periods of high flow, the water can access some of the floodplain. Um, and so this is a really great stream in itself for fish to rear, to spawn and rear in it. Um, but it lacked the large woody debris that provides a complex environment that provides scouring and pools for salmon to hold over in, um, provides protection and cover and uh, will can create more side channels for the fish to access, <coughs> as well as um, back backwaters that the fish can use. Here's another before pre-project photo of one of the sections. And these pictures look a little different because they're taken at different times of the year. That was obviously a springtime photo when there was a lot of water. This is in the middle of summer when there's not very much water in this stream. But here's an example of one of the large woody debris structures that was installed. Um, <clears throat> this project was approximately one mile of stream and consisted of 14 large woody debris structures. Um, they also were able to take some large old growth trees that were already down within the area and place those in the stream to, stream to provide more habitat. So these complex debris jams, so the stream is down here, um, provide winter refugia habitat, uh, spawning gravel retention, so they'll catch the, spawn, the gravel and help sort it. Um, it creates pool habitat, provides cover from predation, and increases floodplain connectivity. So this winter time, right now, when the, ri the river is much higher, uh, this is probably pushing the, the stream off into the, the floodplain. And here is an example of the gravel collection. This is the same, um, this was earlier in this year, provided by Aaron, thank you, <laughs> of the gravel actually sorting out and collecting um, in front of one of the structures, and that'll provide great habitat for spawning salmon. And so that, the Little Grand Rapids project was in partnership with Weyerhaeuser, Columbia Timberlands, um, and in, par in conjunction with a, timber, a commercial timber harvest on the neighboring property to the stream. And so we were able to source the trees from on site, which lowers the cost. Um, and they were actually donated by Weyerhaeuser. And then we were able to get a small grant to provide funding for that project. Another large <coughs> debris enhancement project was on the, oops, Upper North Fork, um, which is in a similar area to the Little Grand Rapids project um, towards the headwaters. Please ignore the title on this one. I forgot, obviously forgot to change that to Upper North Fork. I'm not taking photos, so then I'm going to just move on because that's not the right slide. <laughs> This, this is what the Upper North Fork looks like. So it's got a very wide, um, broad floodplain. And it actually had some good um, habitat already where there was a lot of off-channel habitat. However, it really lacked a lot of spawning gravels, um, as you can see from the really fine sediments along the sides um, and in the stream channel. So this project, obviously, it also lacked complexity. Um, spawning gravel and off-channel habitat. This is aimed at coho salmon, winter steelhead cutthroat, coastal cutthroat, and lamprey. Uh, this project was in partnership with uh, an Oregon Department of Forestry thinning, um, and so we were also able to source the trees from right on site, um, which lowered the cost, and they were donated by the Oregon Department of Forestry. And here is what one of the 
largely debris structures looks like afterwards. So for these projects, we really, it's great to be able to source the trees from on site because we're able to get whole trees with the limbs and the root wads still attached. Usually if we have to source them off site, they have to remove those. And so you're not getting that benefit of having uh, all of these different surfaces basically to spread out the stream channel. And so this one, also said one, was 1.4 miles of stream habitat that was treated and we had seven large woody debris sites. Um, and these actually, we had planned on a lot more sites for this project, um, but when we got on the ground, it was very wet, and so we had to kind of focus our, our installation areas, but we were able to make the large woody debris um, complexes much longer than you would normally see. Usually it's just a, a few, two to three trees um, in one site, but for this one we were able to expand the footprint of each structure. <coughs> and here's an example of a pool already being created, even in the end of the summer month when the stream was a lot lower. Um, you had a really deep pool that had backed up from the trees being able to interlock with those attached uh, branches. So our other three projects that we worked on the ground on this year were monitoring and maintenance projects. <coughs> um, our Neocani Lake Creek and Wetland Enhancement Project, which is just upstream from the new culvert on Highway 101. Um, our South Fork Dairy Riparian Enhancement, which is along the main stem of the Halem right before you go over the Molar Bridge on Highway 53. And our Gods Valley Meadows Project, which is out about seven miles out Gods Valley Road. Uh, I'm just gonna go in to detail on the Neal County Lake Creek and Wetland Project right now. Um, God's Valley Meadows and the South Fork Dairy Riparian Enhancement were just ma um, a lot of maintenance work. Um, so clearing around the trees that we had already planted, doing some fencing work in the case of South Fork. Um, and we had a work party out at God's Valley Meadows, which I'll touch on later. <clears throat> so the Neocani Lake Creek and Wetland Enhancement Project was actually mostly completed before I started with the Watershed Council and the only remaining things to do were to take care of all these little tiny trees that you see planted out there, all the little black dots. Um, those are actually the trees that had been installed surrounded by uh, black uh, fabric to keep the weeds down. And so this project, historically, the site was managed for pasture and the lake was managed as a water lily nursery. Um, it had been ditched and diked in several places. The stream had been ditched and diked in several places. Um, it was primarily invasive species, including reed canary grass. <clears throat> and the stream lacked complexity from lar uh, and large woody debris. There was also downstream, just up from where the culvert is, a historic splashboard dam that blocked fish passage for nearly 100 years. And so, in Partnership, this project came about when ODOT was beginning to look at replacing this culvert on Highway 101, which was a complete fish passage barrier. Um, and so we wanted to work with the landowner upstream to get the lake and the wetland in shape for when fish were actually able to ac access it. And so this project reestablished um, natural channel processes it placed large woody debris on the edge of the stream um, and in the stream we treated the invasive species and we established native species. So this is a good look. Um, these plants are probably four years old, these hardwood trees, and so they're already well above what we call free to go height, which is about shoulder height when they're above most of the invasive species, so they can outcompete. You can see some of the smaller uh, spruce trees, they take a little bit longer to grow than the hardwoods do. And then we also planted native wetland plants. So here's an example of one of our spruce trees doing really well out there. And also an example of some of the problems that we run into as far as very genius beavers who seem to be able to climb cages and cut down trees at <laughs> shoulder height. But I haven't figured out how beavers would do that. <laughs> um, 
They also are great restoration biologists themselves. Um, they've created a lot of dams out of this site and flooded areas that we didn't anticipate being flooded, um, which killed some of our trees, but also helped establish a lot of the native wetland plants out there. Um, so one thing we've learned from this project is that it might be effective to allow beavers to do some of their work before we go out and plant, um, because they will change the hydrology of an area, um, and we could lose some more plants. So here's a picture of okay, I think my pictures are just out of order. Um, but here's a picture of the historic splashboard dam that's just downstream of the lake. Um, and so this was addressed this fall by ODOT when they replaced the culvert. They went ahead and removed this dam as well. And so as of this fall, the fish passage is completely open for salmon to access the area. So here's a photo of the new culvert under Highway 101 if you haven't had a chance to check it out. Um, it's quite the engineering masterpiece. Um, and they also have a lot of large woody debris structures that they placed in stream to roughen the channel um, and slow the water down as it's coming out of the lake there. Here's the area where the splash dam was after it had been removed, so that's why they got out of order. So on to a project that was supposed to be under construction this summer, the Jetty Creek Fish Passage Project. Um, but due to the number of projects that were on the ground last year and us getting a late start on going out to bid, this project is now um, going out to bid next week and will be implemented this uh, construction season in summer 2017. Um, so we have our funding and our permits secured for this one. <clears throat> so the Jetty Creek Fish Passage is a partnership with the City of Rockaway Beach. Um, I'm sorry for the blurriness of this picture. Um, but this is the city's water treatment facility and their impoundment for their raw water. Um, and this is just off of Highway 101 um, at the Jetty Creek Fishery, just upstream of that. Uh, the project's goal is to restore fish passage above the facility to 1.8 miles of habitat. Um, to restore natural stream function, to maintain in-stream the in-stream water rate, and to improve the screening intake. So right now, this is their screened intake. And it doesn't have to be effective because currently there's no fish up there, but if we were to open this up without addressing that, then we'd have an issue with fish being taken into the intake. Um, so here's looking at the project from the downstream side. Um, so this dam is the only <coughs> remaining fish passage barrier on the main stem of Jetty Creek. Um, and throughout the two, early 2000s, the upstream landowner replaced a number of undersized culverts. And downstream of it, the bridge under, or the Highway 101 bridge was replaced um, to open up fish passage. So this is the drawings for the project. Um, what we're proposing to do is to create a natural bypass channel. So here's the here is the impoundment. The city's water facility is down here. The dam is right there. And what we're going to do is create a natural channel, basically reconnect an old stream channel along the base of the hill over here. So the fish will be able to go completely around the city's impoundment. Uh, we'll also be expanding the capacity of the storage facility from 50,000 gallons to 300,000 gallons. Mm -hmm. And this will allow the city to rely on that stored water during low flow periods when we really need to focus on keeping water in stream for fish to use when there's uh, really high temperatures. Um, it will also help the city, um, this tends to get some, uh, filled in with sediment uh, during the winter and they have to dredge it out regularly, and so this will allow them to turn off the intake via a fish screen up here during high flow periods when the water is really turbid or sediment laden. Um, and so all of that sediment will just be directed naturally down the bypass channel. Uh, we're also adding a 
fish screen um, that will keep juvenile salmonids from entering the impoundment. So if we're lucky, we'll have a construction contractor on board next month to do this project in the summer. So that's kind of an overview of the restoration and enhancements projects that we had on the ground this year. Um, we also did a number of assessments and planning projects. Um, we finalized our basin-wide assessment of road stream crossings, um, prioritizing them for culverts for repair or replacement based on their severity as a fish passage barrier, structural integrity, and neighboring habitat quality and quality. So the number of stream miles and how good they are for salmon above that. Um, we're also actively participating in the ongoing development of the Nahalem Strategic Action Plan for COHO, um, which is a partnership with the Upper Nahalem Watershed Council and a number of private and agency partners. Um, and we are one of three pilot watersheds participating in the development of these strategic action plans. And this will help us to identify restoration projects that will have the best the biggest bang for our buck uh, for salmon to implement and a long-term plan for implementing those projects um, will also act as a way for us to leverage funding large amounts of funding um, to knock out some of those projects in a very systematic matter, manner <clears throat> our culvert assessment the first one i just talked about um, is now available online at our website under the resources tab that battery did not last um, this project, the uh, on-the-ground portion of it was done in 2015, and our contractor surveyed 467 road stream crossings, many of which uh, were either bridges or did not exist, um, but 186 were fish culverts, 120 complete barriers to fish passage, 13 were partial barriers, meaning they only blocked juvenile fish passage, and 53 were not barriers. Uh, from that, we were able to identify 38 high-priority culverts within the basin, 45 medium-priority, and 50 lower-priority um, that we will be beginning to develop projects for in 2017 and moving forward, um, utilizing the data and that plan to pick and bundle projects ge uh, geographically to go after funding. We also do events, outreach, and education. Um, in 2016, we involved over 20 volunteers in outreach and education, science, uh, board service, technical <coughs> service, and habitat enhancement. We engaged over 200 community members at, um, that was not supposed to be a number sign, public watershed speaker series events, um, tours, and an annual barbecue, and that probably is about 10 events. We provided educational material, watershed council information, and promoted partnerships at tabling events throughout Tillamook County. Um, here's just some examples of our different events. This was uh, at the Manzanitas Farmers Market. We partnered with the Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve to offer information about the watershed, as well as the ocean, and to discuss the watershed, the land and sea connection. Um, we hosted our annual barbecue at the McDonald's Slough Project this year. Um, where we uh, grilled up uh, <coughs> burgers for our attendees and then gave a pre presentation about the project. I think we had about 50 people actually attend that event. Um, and then we hosted one volunteer work party this year. We uh, try to do more than that, but we're unfortunately only able to do one where we planted native trees out at God's Valley Meadows. <coughs> And we placed Christmas trees in stream to provide habitat for uh, rearing salmon. We also participated in a number of partnerships this year. Um, one of our biggest ones was the Explore Nature Partnership, which is a collaboration of environmental organizations working together to provide meaningful nature-based events. Um, so on the ground events to get you on the land and learning about the watershed that you live in. <clears throat> they showcase the uniqueness of Tillamook County and the work being done by the different organizations to conserve our natural resources, restore biodiversity, and preserve natural resource-based industries. Um, we also are a partner on the Northwest Oregon Restoration Partnership, 
um, which has a native plant nursery down in Tillamook, um, and it engages community members of all ages in growing local native plants that are actually um, genetically fit for this area, um, coast, that have coastal genetics. Um, and for riparian restoration, wetland and upland landscapes in northwest Oregon. So this is our brand new um, logo for the Explore Nature series. Um, we will be, there are our brochures for that program on the back table. And starting in March, we will have our next calendar of events. Um, and there will be a lot of events this year um, between the numerous partner organizations throughout Tillamook County, um, including land tours, some kayak tours, um, a photography workshop, um, all kinds of ways to get out and get on the land. So this is just a highlight of our funding and our expenses this year. <coughs> um, so most of our funding comes from state grants. Um, that would include the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, as well as Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's Restoration and Enhancement Program. Um, and a very far majority of it all goes towards our habitat and enhancement projects. These are some of our, these are our project funders from 2016, um, the City of Rockaway Beach on the Jetty Creek Project, the Economic Development Council of Tillamook County provided funding for the, as well as Visit Tillamook Coast for the Explore Nature um, brochures. Steve Nearing, the landowner at our McDonald's Food Project, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Restoration and Enhancement Program, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board is by far our biggest funder, um, the Port of Nehalem. Tillamook County Public Works, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Wild Sand Center all provided funding towards our work this year. That's the same list. Uh, our in-kind partners, who we would not be able to do the work that we do, <coughs> have, include the Friends of Cape Falcon Marine Reserve, Lower New Haven Community Trust, New Haven Marine Inc., Northwest Oregon Restoration Partnership. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's Fish Passage Program, the Oregon Department of Forestry, Tillamook Estuaries Partnership, and Warehouse of Columbia Timberland. These are partners who provide goods or services um, or time, staff time, um, to match our to match on our projects. And our 2016 Board of Directors were Samantha Ferber, our chair. I don't know if you guys want to raise your hand as I say your names. <laughs> so, Samantha Ferber, our board chair. Mark McLaughlin, our vice chair. Back here. In the back. Hi. Um, Barb Moore, our secretary treasurer. Um, Joe Watkins. Ted Chu. Ted's here. Uh, Eric Nielsen. And Will Russell. Thank you guys for being here. And I want to say a very special thank you to our board of directors, our council members, our volunteers, and our community members who have been incredibly supportive um, throughout this year and all of the years previously um, by uh, attending meetings and presentations and dedicating themselves to the restoration and preservation of the Lower Hale watershed without their support that we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do. So how can you get involved in 2017? You can sign up in the back to receive more information. Um, you can volunteer. I am planning on hosting work parties or at least partnering with others on work parties this year. Um, so we hope that you can join us at one of those on our project sites. Um, you can become a member. Um, you do need to attend two Watershed Council events uh, in the last six months and then the Board of Directors will um, vote you in as a member. The duties of the members include uh, voting in the Board of Directors at this January meeting, so that's our next step. Um, you can join the Board of Directors. We have already closed nominations for this year, but next year, um, I usually send out that in November or December, requesting nominees for the Board of Directors. And you can attend a council meeting. Our next council meeting is February 1st at 3 o'clock at the Mahalo City Hall. Um, we also have our regularly scheduled presenter series throughout the winter. Our next one uh, it's February 9th, and our presenter is Daniel Bottom, who's a author and retired NOAA scientist. And that presentation is going to be on wetland recovery and salmon population resilience. Any questions? That was just kind of a snapshot of all of the things that we do. Um, so if you're interested in learning no more, 
please let me know and I'd be happy to uh, talk or provide you with more information.